from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, good afternoon. Welcome to the Library of Congress. I'm John Cole. I'm the director of the Center for the Book in the Library of Congress, and I'm pleased to uh, welcome you to a talk by Michael Durda in our Books and Beyond series. It's a series that uh, features new books by authors uh, who have a special connection to the Library of Congress, either having worked with us in various projects or, in fact, have used the Library of Congress's collections uh, in developing uh, a book. And since we're in charge of reading and book promotion, there's nothing better than being able to uh, show the result of research by being able to hold up a real book uh, that has been published and through which, of course, the author is sharing his or her ideas and thoughts. All of our talks in this series uh, are filmed and are available on the Center for the Book's website. And with that in mind, I ask you to please turn off all things electronic, all beepers. We will have a question and answer session after Michael's presentation. And we hope that uh, you will participate. But if you have a question and Michael calls on you, uh, you and you choose to, to uh, ask the question, you are giving the Library of Congress permission to use your image and your words uh, on our website uh, production. Classics are classics not because they are educational, but because people have found them worth reading generation after generation, century after century. More than anything else, great books speak to us of our own all too real feelings, confusions, and daydreams. This is how Michael introduces his new book, and you will learn, we will learn together uh, the motivation behind the book, perhaps the selection criteria he used, and perhaps uh, a little bit more about why he came to pick this book, because in fact he has, as many of you know, uh, a series of books, many of them uh, essays from articles that he's written or reprints, but also a lot of new material uh, in his series of books about books. Uh, he's the author of the memoir, An Open Book, which he actually spoke about at the Library of Congress in 2003, which was the same year Michael appeared at the National Book Festival, for which the Center for the Book is at least uh, partially responsible and in which we play a major role. His other books, collections, include Bound to Please, published by Norton in 2005, Book by Book, published by Holt, uh, Notes of a Re and Book by Book, Notes on Reading and Life, published by Holt in 2006. As I said, he also has uh, figured and pre uh, worked at the Library of Congress programs and been part of our programs for a number of years. Uh, he also, as I, he and I were discussing earlier, uh, is an essayist, and he just has a new essay in the uh, Chronicle of Higher Education's review which is about a writer's conference in New York. It's called Bright Lights, Big Conference, and it's a reflection on the big city and writing. I'm pleased to introduce to you the Pulitzer Prize winning critic from the Washington Post, Michael Durda. Michael. Okay. Thank, you. Well, thank you, John, for those very kind words. I know there, there are people standing. If you want to come down and sit here, there's a lot of room on the floor. Or there's a little table you can lean on, uh, whatever you feel most comfortable with. But there is space down here. You can pretend you're five years old again, and this is story hour at your elementary school, because it really will be kind of like story hour. Uh, as some of you may know, uh, I'm really a very rambling, digressive, conversational kind of speaker, not a very formal one at all. And so I'm, I'm just going to talk a little about the genesis of this book and uh, describe a little bit of what I did here or hope to do, and then probably read one of the, the uh, pieces. Um, anyway, that's my uh, ostensible program. But I do love questions, and I love the interaction with an audience after the f more formal part of a, of a talk. So if you do have questions about uh, books or reading or post or book world or me or any of my you know, essays or what have you, please uh, feel free to ask them and I uh, look forward to that part. Um, again, here's your chance now if anybody wants to come down front. I recommend it. There, there you go, okay. 
stalwart figures up there. Um, we'll, let, we'll, we'll wait a, a moment. First of all, can everyone hear me okay? Is this, is this good or am I too close or too far? Is there weird echoes? My experience is that microphones never work right. Um, okay, classics for pleasure. Uh, how did this book come about and how does it differ from my other books? Well, as, as John said, I have written a number of books about books. Um, and they all are somewhat different. Readings is a collection of uh, familiar essays about what reading has meant to me. It's got lists, and some of the pieces are wistful and comic, and uh, it's a real potpourri. An open book was a memoir about how I grew up in a very working class steel town, Lorain, Ohio, and discovered books, and how they consequently shaped my life, up to, at least up to the age of 19. That's as far as I go with the story. The um, big collection, Bound to Please, has, I guess, as serious a collection of my pieces as you'll, you're likely to find. It's somewhat similar to Classics for Pleasure. And Book by Book is based on my commonplace book. Um, most of you probably know what a commonplace book is, but it's uh, basically a notebook where you copy passages and quotations from your reading that you particularly like and want to keep close at hand as a kind of little bedside breviary or, or, or just as a a repository of favorite uh, quotations, passages. I've kept one for a long time. And I thought, well, maybe I could use this to turn it into a book. And so what I did in book by book was select some of the, uh, the shorter passages and uh, categorize them in chapters, uh, like life or love or work and leisure or spiritual things, uh, and intersperse them with little mini essays of reflections of my own and book lists. So I, I, think, it's a, I think it's a cute book. Um, this book, however, goes back to my childhood, really. Some of you may know uh, from my having spoken about or having read an open book that when I was a kid, um, I once was left at a department. There were no bookshops in Lorraine. There were, it was a library, but a lot of the books I was interested in as a boy weren't available in bookshops. So I used to you know, go to the Whalen's Drug Store and read paperbacks. But Sometimes I would be forced to go with my mother shopping to the department stores. And one of them had a little section of books, mostly Bibles and sort of uplifting uh, books of that sort. But also they would have a run of uh, the Hardy Boys or some Tarzans. And it was my practice to go there and not being able to afford hardbound books, at least not very often, I would just stand there all afternoon and read the whole book. Um, <laughs> And but one, so one afternoon, I had finished whatever I was reading and had, had another 15 minutes or something before my mother was due to pick me up outside the, the doorways at this uh, particular department store. And I noticed there was a rack of paperbacks off in a corner that I had not really noticed before. But it was a little unusual. I, I, so I went over there and I discovered these paperbacks didn't have any covers on them and there were three of them in, pl in each plastic bag on this rack. And they were cheap. They were like three for 50 cents. Uh, I couldn't understand what this was all about. I do no understand now the, the, uh, the department store had torn off the covers of the paperbacks, sent them back for full credit to the publishers, and then were supposed to uh, shred the books, throw them away, but certainly not sell them. <laughs> <laughs> but they decided they would make a few extra pennies this way. Well, of course, looking at these, these various little packages of books, I realized that no no three books were in, that, were, that had interesting sounding titles were in the same bag. In those days, I always carried a pocket knife and carried one. <laughs> and uh, up until the, the, you know, the, the security at the Library of Congress started confiscating them when I would come here, and I don't carry them as often as I once did. But in those days, I did. And I got out my knife and slid open some of these bags and mixed and matched you know, <laughs> attractive looking titles. Again, if you'd like to come down front, please, there's, uh, there's plenty of room here on the floor. If you get tired of, of standing, um, don't hesitate. Um, I, I, I decided I, you know, to, to, to put together a one little package of these, these, these books. Of course, I realized you know, that I, you know, this is sort of like stealing. It didn't seem quite ethical. So, um, but I wanted these books at this, by this time. And 
So I clamped my fingers really tightly over the slit in the plastic bags <laughs> and, well, you know, sweating profusely like, you know, uh, like Peter Lorre in M, if you've ever seen that old movie. <laughs> you know, I, I, I give my 50 cents to the cashier and then race out where my mother is uh, driving the getaway car. She doesn't, <laughs> doesn't realize it's the getaway car. And off we go to another store, probably to buy stuff for my sisters. I stay in the car at this point to look at my new treasures. Um, one, one of them was um, a book called Which Way to Mecca, Jack? Uh, and it was by a writer I'd never heard of, but it was supposed to be a laugh fest. It was supposed to be hilarious. And it was, in fact, very funny. But it was by a writer who's not known now for being particularly funny, in fact, for being extremely scary. It was by William Peter Blatty, who later went on to write The Exorcist. And it was a kind of, it was a memoir about growing up. The other, uh, the second book I, I picked up was a series, a, a Sam Durrell thriller. Sam Durrell was a, an American spy, sort of somewhat like James Bond, but without all the cosmopolitan suavity of Bond. And, and the books weren't even all that very well written. I mean, Matt Helm was much superior to Sam Durrell. But I loved them because they all had the same titles. They were all called Assignment blank, you know, Assignment Shanghai, Assignment Sulu Sea. The one I happened to buy was Assignment Ankara. And so they're, 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 that was great fun. But the last book I, was the one that matters in this case because I put it in as, a, as kind of as a last minute lark. I'd already started to get interested in reading more seriously. I was, I was at this, you know, 12 or 13 when this all happened. And it was a book called the Lifetime Reading Plan by Clifton Fadiman. And I took this book home and I started reading the introductory essay by Fadiman, which is very winning. And he made reading, you know, classics sound as if they would be as much fun as reading Tarzan or the Hardy Boys. And I then gradually read a couple of the essays in the book. It was, it is basically, it still exists, there have been revisions. Um, it exists as a kind of guide to a hundred great books that you should read, and each book or author has a, 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 an ingratiating essay uh, <laughs> attempting to make the book sound as inviting and entertaining as possible. Well, I used this book to guide my reading, because I didn't have any guidance to speak of otherwise, for a long time. And uh, I, by the time I graduated from high school, I'd probably read 60 or 70 of these great books read in the sense of my eyes passed across the page. Uh, but you know what I got out of Kant's prolegomena to any future metaphysics of morals at the age of 15 is difficult to determine at this point in time. <laughs> However, we now zip across you know, the intervening decades and we come closer to the present where a man named Andre Bernard is the editor-in-chief of Harcourt. Andre Bernard was, a, was a, now the vice president of the Guggenheim Foundation. He left Harcourt. But he, he, was, he was a guy I'd known in publishing for a good many years, and he knew this story about Fadiman. And he'd known my essays and the kind of uh, pieces I write, which are, in fact, rather similar in character to Fadiman's. We now, we now look back on, on, or, and look down on, on Clifton Fadiman as a very symbol of, of middle-brow America. I mean, this was a man who was the... Uh, the, the sort of the, the bastion of the Book of the Month Club's reader's circle for you know, 50 years, maybe? I don't know how long. Uh, he was a man who started reviewing books in the 1920s. He, read, he reviewed the early Faulkners and said they were terrible, just disgusting books. Uh, but he was also a, a, a great wit, ran Information Please uh, quiz show, and was a power at Simon & Schuster. Um, and now he's probably best remembered because he's the father of Anne Fadiman, who is herself a fine essayist and book lover. Anyway, Andre, when he was a young man, first starting off in publishing, had a job at the Book of the Month Club as Clifton Fadiman's assistant. Andre revered the memory of Fadiman. They had, in fact, done a couple of books together, uh, books of quotations and, I think, children's books. Uh, of, he was interested in children's books at the end of his life. Um, and he came to me and he said, you know, I've always wanted you to do an updated version of the Lifetime Reading Plan. And at first I jumped at this idea. I thought that would be, that would be great. You know, I love these sort of ways of life having come full circle and like, you know, buckles being buckled. And I thought, you know, this would be great. 
But the more I thought about it, the less I, I decided that it wasn't really what I wanted to do. For one reason, there had been revisions of the Lifetime Reading Plan that had added books from um, Asia and Africa and Latin America. Um, the original 100 books were heavily Anglo-American European in their focus. But the rev last revision by a guy named John Major had added 33 books from elsewhere in the world. And, and they were very good choices. And uh, I had no argument with any of this. And then I realized to do an updated version for the 21st century, whatever, you'd still have to cover a lot of the same writers. And it seemed to me pointless to write another little essay inviting people to read Shakespeare uh, or Homer or any of the obvious classics. So that didn't seem at all interesting to me. So what I proposed to Andre was instead a kind of beyond the lifetime reading plan, the next hundred books you might read, where I would have a chance to write about slightly different sorts of classics. The actual contents of the book and its character morphed slightly after Andre left Harcourt to go to the Guggenheim. And I, I, I inherited another editor, a woman named pa Anne Patty, who is a very, very interesting woman in her own right. She's both a very literary editor. Stephen Milhauser, one of the most literary and wonderful writers around, is, was her, her, her author for many years. But she also edited um, V.C. Andrews, you know, you, know, you know, Petals in the Wind, Flowers in the Attic, whatever, all those, you know, Southern Gothic incest novels. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, the, the way the book evolved was this. I decided I liked the idea of, of extending the lifetime reading plan to neglected classics. So I wanted to write about classics that we had now decided were interesting and important that might not have been thought of as interesting and important 50 years ago, but they've become so. Um, then I also wanted to do, I didn't want to repeat any of the books I'd written about in any of my other books. I wrote about a lot, about a lot of obvious world classics in Bound to Please particularly. People like Isak Babel, and, oh, and, and I later wrote about Murasaki Shikubu in uh, readings, and uh, just a great many of them. Still, there were a lot left uh, that I hadn't written about and I wanted to write about. But last, the last category I wanted to include were what I would call classics of genre literature, popular literature, uh, books like um, George Ed Hayer's Regency Romances, The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, Frankenstein, Dracula. Um, Ryder Haggard's She, um, H.G. Wells' Science Fiction, Philip K. Dick's books, uh, Edward Gorey, uh, people who were not thought of as typical classics, but were classics within their field, who had, you know, started or were foundational texts within horror or romance or fantasy or science fiction and thus had shaped our imaginations, the way we think about literature and ourselves, as much as any of the more obvious classics. Then I wanted to mix all these books together to say that what matters are, is good writing, good books, regardless of genre. As many of you may know from my work at the Post, over the years I've always argued against this artificial barrier that exists between certain kinds of high literature and what's thought to be uh, popular literature that the, the, you know, books are well written or not. That's really what it all comes down to. And, and these, these, these genres are often just marketing devices. Um, and I've also argued against the bestseller list, which is something I dislike intensely. The restraint of trade. People just go and they buy what's on the bestseller list. They don't go and look at the books on the shelves, read a page or two, talk to their friends, and, and thus discover books that might speak to them much more powerfully and more immediately than anything on the bestseller list. Anyway, what kind of books do I have in this, this, this uh, collection? Um, I'll read you the contents, and then I'll read one of the essays, and then we'll open for questions. And I'll put on my reading glasses, because age has begun to catch up with me, I'm sorry to say. Probably should get bifocals, and no one would know. Um, okay, so originally I was going to do chronological order, and I said, no, that would, be, that would be hard on people because you'd start with all the more difficult and demanding books from antiquity, and um, they might, you, know, you might lose your readers before you get them hooked. So I mixed them up into categories, but they're kind of chronological within categories. So here are just the authors. Playful Imaginations. Um, and I, I won't describe any of them, maybe one or two, but uh, uh, Lucian, 
Denis de, uh, Diderot, Thomas Love Peacock, Max Beerbohm, Jaroslav Hasek, wrote the good soldier Shrek, sort of the catch-22 of World War I, Ivy Compton Burnett, S.J. Perlman, Italo Calvino, Edward Gorey, heroes of their time, Beowulf, um, Ferdowsi wrote the, the Persian epic, the Shahnameh, uh, the Icelandic sagas, Christopher Marlowe, Still writing about Shakespeare, I write about Webster and Marlowe. Um, Emil Zola, Jung, uh, Ernst Jünger. Ernst Jünger uh, wrote Storm of Steel, which is a memoir of, um, of Jünger's fighting for the, the Germans during World War I. I think I can manage without these. He, he enlisted when he was 18, fought throughout the war, uh, won the Iron Cross first class, and was eventually awarded the Pour le Mérite, which despite its French name is the highest award for valor in Germany, and was the youngest man ever to win it. Um, but this is an incredible memoir of, of, of battle, seen from the German side, where it's, it's, almost, it's like Homer. There's almost no political sense at all to it. It's just men going into battle and dying. And it is, it is just a very powerful book. Uh, interesting things, Jünger, Jünger lived to be 102. He only died about 15, 20 years ago. I could have talked to him. Um, it's incredible when people live that long. Um, he's also a man of the right, although he later wrote a book critical of Hitler um, called On the Marble Cliffs, kind of an allegory critical of the, of, the, of the Nazis. Hitler, he was such a hero in Germany as a young man that Hitler sent him an inscribed copy of Mein Kampf. Um, uh, James Agee, that's the last of heroes of their time. Uh, Loves Mysteries, Sappho, the Arthurian Romances, Madame de Lafayette, Soren Kierkegaard, I read about the Diary of the Seducer, just a chilling text. Um, George Meredith, I, I love his sonnet sequence, Modern Love, about the breakup of a marriage. 16 line sonnets is sort of his own, own thing, but they're, it's, oh, they're just, there's they're just wonderful stuff. Um, gosh, I could read you the last the poems. He's a sort of forgotten poet, he's remembered as a novelist. Uh, but the last one of the last one after the, the divorce has gone through finally. Uh, lovers beneath the singing sky of May, they wandered once, clear as the dew on flowers, but they fed not on the advancing hours. Their hearts held cravings for the buried day, then each applied to each that fatal knife, deep questioning which probes to endless dole. Ah, what a dusty answer gets the soul when hot for certainties in this our life goes on from there. It's just wonderful stuff. Um, uh, Kevafi, the great Greek uh, Alexandrian poet. Georgette Hare, I love I love her Regency romances. They're incredibly witty. They're like Jane Austen. Um, Anna Akhmatova, the Russian poet. Daphne du Maurier, write about Rebecca. It's both a romance and an anti-romance. Uh, Words from the Wise, Lao Tse, the Tao. Uh, Heraclitus, Cicero. Erasmus, the English religious tradition. Spinoza, Samuel Johnson. Everyday Magic, Sir Gawain in the Green Knight, the classic fairy tales, E.T.A. Hoffman, you know, Tales from Hoffman. The Sandman is famous, because um, Freud wrote about it, his essay on the uncanny. Uh, Mary May, who wrote The Venus of Eel, probably the most famous uh, French short story, well, fantasy short story of the 19th century about the guy who puts his, the ring on Venus, the statue of Venus's finger. Um, Francis Hodgson Burnett, The Secret Garden. E. Nesbitt, I love the five children books. Uh, John Macefield, um, and Walter de la Mer. Uh, e. Nesbitt, I'm always charmed by the children, her children's books. She really established modern children's uh, writing with these adventures of kids meeting fantastic creatures like uh, the Samid or the Phoenix. And, uh, and you know, people often put down children's literature as I think that you can't read it as an adult. Great children's books are really, really appealing to any age. They're, they're talking about fundamental qualities in our lives. And uh, Noel Coward, the most you know, consummate sophisticate of our time, when he, was, when he was dying in the last months of his life, he spent all his time reading E. Nesbitt. Um, Lives of Consequence, Plutarch, Cardano, uh, John Aubrey, Aubrey's brief lives are gossip about uh, the Renaissance, uh, figures about uh, of the early 17th century and late 16th century. They're, they're, they're wonderful fun. Uh, Pope, Rousseau, Frederick Douglass, Jacob Burkhart, Henry James, W.H. Auden. The Dark Side, John Webster, Mary Shelley, 
James Hogue. James Hogue, or perhaps Hogg, I'm not even sure. Um, any of you know a book called Memoirs and Confessions of a Justified Sinner? The, just one of the great dark psychological suspense novels of the 19th century. It's somewhat like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, but with religious hypocrisy and uh, lots of other stuff thrown in. It's just a wonderful book. Um, Sheridan Le Fanu, the great Irish ghost story writer, and sensational novels. Um, uh, Uncle Silas is you know, as good as The Woman in White or Moonstone. And his, his novel, The House by the Churchyard, was, a, was one of, the, one of a, a really an important source for Finnegan's Wake. It's, it's often referred to in the buried way that Finnegan's Wake is, it works. Uh, Bram Stoker, uh, M.R. James, William Roughhead, who wrote two crime reports about all the murders in Scotland and England at the late, between the late 19th century and the early 20th century. And they really established that, that, that genre. H.P. Lovecraft. I love H.P. Lovecraft. <laughs> um, Traveler's Tales. Thomas More, Daniel Defoe, Xavier de Mestre. Uh, de Mestre was a, a soldier who was confined to his quarters for dueling during the Napoleonic Wars. And he decided to imagine that his room was the world, and he would journey around his room. So he wrote a, a whole book called Journey Around My Room, where all the objects in the room recall aspects of his past. And he, he journeys, it takes him, you know, pages and pages to get from his bed to, you know, the, 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 the bureau next door to it. You know. um, Jules Verne, or Jules Verne, I should. Um, to, Brian doesn't work here, I know uh, Tavis, who's a great Jules Verne expert. Uh, he's out in Virginia now, I know. Uh, J.K. Wiesmans, you know, who wrote Au Rebours Against the Grain, about the guy who retreats to his house and creates a world of his own. Isak Dinesen, Robert Byron, Robert Byron the great, wrote the travel book. The Road to Oxiana, which Paul Fussell famously acclaimed to be the equivalent of the wasteland for travel books. The Way We Live Now, Petronius, Elizabeth Gaskell, Ivan Goncharov, Jose Maria Eka de Queiroz, Chekhov, Jean Toomer, Willa Cather, Celine, Zora Neale Hurston, Eudora Welty. Realms of Adventure, Ryder Haggard, Arthur Conan Doyle, Rudyard Kipling, H.G. Wells, G.K. Chesterton, Agatha Christie, Dashiell Hammett. Encyclopedic Visions, Ovid, Robert Burton, Edward Gibbon, J.G. Fraser, H.W. Fowler, Ezra Pound, Andre Malraux, Philip K. Dick. So those are the writers. So it is a, it is a, a broad range, potpourri. And I write about them all, I hope, in, a, in an invitational way, not as a critic. I've not really ever thought of myself as a critic in the sort of uh, serious scholarly academic critic. Um, I write for other readers, and I want, I, you know, I love a lot of books, and I want to tell you why I love them, and I want you to love them, too. Anyway, that's my intent. Now, how are we doing on time? Okay. Uh, I presume this is for an hour, right? Correct. Okay, so I've got about 12.25 or 12.30. I'm going to read one of the entries, which should take probably about 10 minutes, and then we'll have some questions, okay? Let's see. And I didn't know what to read exactly. I like them all. Um, <laughs> you know, it's like you know the story of Swift when he was old. And he went back and reread *A Tale of a Tub*, and he said, "Ah, oh, what genius I had then!" <laughs> but I, you know, this this seems a scary group. So I thought we'd read um, M.R. James's collected ghost stories. Ready? Get cozy, get comfortable, put on your slippers, you know, <laughs> glass of wine, cup of tea. What Sherlock Holmes's adventures are to the mystery, M.R. James's 30 or so ghost stories of an antiquary are to horror and the supernatural. In his lifetime, James was the greatest English authority on the New Testament Apocrypha, a bibliographer of medieval manuscripts, an amateur expert on early church architecture and decoration, a Cambridge dawn, and eventually the Provost of Eton. All these contribute their part to what are widely regarded as the finest ghostly tales in English. Originally, James's stories of revenants, demons, and black magic were intended to be enjoyed as shivery Christmas treats. After the seasonal feast and good cheer, Monty, that's his, Mon Mon that's his name, Montague Rhodes James, would read one or two aloud to his friends at Cambridge or his students at Eton. 
By a single candle, after all other lights had been extinguished, the bespectacled scholar would gradually create a sense of unease, of growing eeriness and expectation. Many of the stories begin quite casually, often when a middle-aged bachelor, typically a don, visits an old church or country house, or takes a holiday in Denmark or France, and there stumbles across something from the past, an old diary, an enig enigmatic inscription on a tomb, puzzling symbols in stained glass, or even an 18th century maze in which one never feels quite alone. In Canon Alberic's scrapbook, Mr. Denniston spends an afternoon of his holiday abroad sketching the interior of a decaying French cathedral. Toward evening, he notices that, quote, the church began to fill with shadows, while the curious noises, the muffled footfalls and distant talking voices that had been perceptible all day, seemed no doubt because of the fading light and the consequently quickened sense of hearing to become more frequent and insistent. Ironically, James's heroes shrug off what at first seemed only curious. Who wouldn't? Those muffled sounds must be some odd echo or sympathetic vibration from the thick stone walls, that shadow a trick of the light, and the unexpected nervousness of the locals a normal response to a stranger in their midst. Could it, though, just possibly be something else? There is that old legend. No matter what the exact circumstance, the past eventually reaches out into the present, and the most seemingly ordinary object or discovery may serve to summon up the horror. In The Mezzotint, Mr. Williams orders a print of an English manor house, one that seems disappointingly unexceptional, aside from the hideous skeletal figure crawling on all fours across the front lawn. <laughs> Taking a vacation at Barnstow, Professor Parkins strolls along the beach and almost literally stumbles upon the ruins of a temple of a Templar preceptory. There, among its crumbling tombstones, he unfortunately makes a small discovery. Quote, it was of bronze, he now saw, and was shaped very much after the manner of the modern dog whistle. In fact, it was, yes, certainly it was, actually no more nor less than a whistle. He put it to his lips. He blew tentatively and stopped suddenly, startled, and yet pleased at the note he had elicited. It had a quality of infinite distance in it, and soft as it was, he somehow felt it must be audible for miles round. Quite a nice little archaeological find, but Parkins can make out only part of the Latin inscription, something about somebody coming. <laughs> Back in his hotel quarters, he decides to blow the whistle again. Quote, Goodness, what force the wind can get up in a few minutes. It's enough to tear the room to pieces. The story, one of James's supreme achievements, takes its deliciously ominous title from a slightly modified line of Robert Burns, O whistle and I'll come to you, my lad. James's scholars and antiquaries generally bring their fates upon themselves sometimes inadvertently or through simple bad luck, but often because they give in to a form of passion. Not sexual, of course, heaven forfend, but rather the passions typical of the academic life. The allure of an arcane discovery, perhaps a spiteful desire for revenge on a colleague, sometimes just the thrill of figuring out a riddle or solving a historical mystery. Anyone, of course, might wish to go after the treasure of Abbot Thomas, some, quote, 10,000 pieces of gold laid up in the well in the court of the abbot's house of Steinfeld. Clever Mr. Somerton learns of their location by deciphering an elaborate cryptogram. Mistakenly, however, he fails to pay sufficient attention to the full coded text, which ends with an enigmatic phrase. The abbot, a dabbler in the dark arts, warns that he has, quote, set a guardian over his wealth. Atmosphere. James himself called it mood, is all important to the cozy style of the English ghost story. Indeed, what nostalgia-laden period flavors what it, indeed that nostalgia-laden period flavors what we now value most in fiction from the late Victorian and Edwardian era. So it may sound less than heretical to say that James's supernatural tales aren't really all that frightening to a modern reader. 
To begin with, they are elaborately framed, often set in the past and laced with a dry humor. Moreover, the main characters are lightly sketched, and James never makes us care greatly about their fates. In this regard, he's rather like Agatha Christie. In truth, what we most deeply enjoy is the storytelling itself, starting with the titles. Casting the Runes, R-U-N-E-S. A Warning to the Curious, Count Magnus. Reading along, we do more than suspend our incredulity, we surrender to the spirit of the game. As James deftly, deftly creates an atmosphere of suggestion and anticipation, we wonder just how and when his various hobgoblins will appear. He is, in fact, a great master of reticence, a quality he much admired in life as in narrative art. Nothing gross or gruesome is described, it is only hinted at. James will usually deliver a single memorable shock. Let me quote an example without giving away the story's title. Uh, a scholar has gone home. He's had some strange things happen to him. He's gone home. Quote. He's gone up to his study. And then he dozed, and then he woke, and bethought himself that his brown spaniel, which normally slept in his room, ordinarily slept in his room, had not come upstairs with him. Then he thought he was mistaken, for happening to move his hand, which hung down over the arm of the chair within a few inches of the floor, he felt on the back of it just the slightest touch of a surface of hair, and stretching it out in that direction, he stroked and patted around it something. But the feel of it, and still more the fact that instead of a responsive movement, absolute stillness greeted the touch, made him look over his arm. What he had been touching rose to meet him. <laughs> James's other gift is a flair for pastiche. In life, he was noted as a mimic, adept at replicating the mannerisms and idiosyncrasies of his colleagues. His stories abound with fabricated antiquarian documents. In Mr. Humphreys and his inheritance, James recreates a 17th century religious tract, one that tells of a man who ventured into a certain maze in search of a great treasure. Quote, he, went on, he went merrily on and without any difficulty, there's lots of capitals and italics in what I'm reading. He went merrily on and without any difficulty reached the heart of the labyrinth and got the jewel and so set out on his way back rejoicing. But as the night fell, wherein all the beasts of the forest do move, he begun to be sensible of some creature keeping pace with him. And as he thought, peering and looking upon him from the next alley to that he was in, and that when he should stop, this companion should stop also, which put him in some disorder of his spirits. And indeed, as the darkness increased, it seemed to him that there was more than one. In all his stories, M.R. James aimed to create what he calls a pleasing terror, and this oxymoron hints at his artistry. More precisely, he remains unrivaled in evoking ominous foreboding and of how easy it is to awaken the unwanted attention of things that should sleep quietly in their tombs or hiding places. So, anyway, that's, I would say that's typical, but <laughs> it's, it's obviously geared to make you want to read these ghost stories, and others are, you know, emphasize the wit or the, or the, the power of the, of the story or the, the language or what, what have you. But I've tried to make each of the pieces uh, as I say, uh, uh, homages to these writers to demonstrate my affection for them and to urge you to give them a try. Well, I've talked a bunch. Let me, let me open the floor to questions, and I'd be happy to answer uh, anything at all, if I can. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Well, actually, Michael, would you repeat the question? The question is, when I was done, did I think, oh, I should have put this writer or that in? I actually wrote 20 more that are in this book. My editor said the book, they wanted to keep the book at $25 uh, in a certain length, and so I cut out 20 of them. There are a lot of good ones. Uh, you know, I put them aside. Who knows? Someday I may do another book where I could use them. Um, but, you know, I, I left out, um, oh. Writers are very dear to me. Uh, the, the piece on Stendhal, for example, not the novels of Stendhal, but Stendhal's wonderful treatise on love. 
and his, his terrific memoir, The Life of Henry Boulard, which takes him up to the age of 19 and is, I'll tell you privately, the secret model for my own, which also takes me up to the age of 19. I left that out. Um, and I wrote my dissertation on Stendhal, so I knew a lot about it. But I figured, well, you know, I didn't need to do that. I could do it another time. But um, um, I hope there may be at least, I may have one more book. There, I have a lot of, a lot of really good essays, I realize still, that have written since this book was planned that I would, uh, I've been writing for other places besides the Post. I've written, wrote a long piece about Dante for the New York Review of Books and on Casanova's memoirs, which I love. Um, written a piece for um, a Nabokov for a reissue of one of his novels. I mean, these occasions where I've, they, I can, I can c cannibalize things I've written and give them more permanent form are always to be welcome. A lot of times, I can, you know, I can't. The books are not that kind of book. But um, um, yeah, there's there's plenty more. I should maybe do a, have a website. I've never understood I could put this stuff up. But every one time people tell me you should have a blog or you should have a website, I keep saying, "What's in it for me? <laughs> Where's the money?" <laughs> um, other questions? Yes, ma'am. I said I said Ovid, the Metamorphoses. Yes. Well, I, I wrote a piece about Ovid's Metamorphoses as, as a, a, I mean, it's it's a, an essay similar to the one I read, and talking about it's important into the in the Western imagination for for storytellers, for you know, uh, for opera, for uh, for the uh, the murals on the walls of courtesans. You know, I mean, it's you know, everyone drew on on Ovid's uh, stories for a thousand years uh, for, illustrations, for illustrations, but also you know, for for poetry and uh, 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 I mean. Something like A Midsummer Night's Dream is a very Ovidian kind of Shakespeare play. Um, but um, I make a number of different points, and I quote some of the some bits of Ovid. Um, another question? In the back. Yes, I've noticed over the years as I read your uh, reviews and enjoyed them very much, you often comment on how your children don't love to read as much as you do. And I was wondering, because they're hypnotized by electronic Question is about, about whether my children read enough, or are they hypnotized by electronic media, and can I say something about the future of reading? My kids all do read, and they've actually read more at, at times in their at different times in their lives. My two younger sons particularly read quite a bit. My middle son is in fact a junior at my old college and majoring in English. Um, I tried to discourage this, but uh, <laughs> but uh, and my youngest son has got a science turn, but he's read all of H.P. Lovecraft, all of Arthur Conan Doyle, all of Jack Vance, who's a science fiction and fantasy writer I love. He's wonderful style. Um, so they do read in that sense, but they also are caught up in 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 computer, the world of computers. I I worry about well, I have two two minds on all of these things. The world will advance whatever I think, and, uh, and clearly the, the the motor here is the computer. It has become more central to our lives than any of us would have thought 25 years ago. I mean, I, re I can remember when computer geeks used to carry around big trays of cards, and if they spilled their cards, they went into apoplectic suicidal fits. Um, and um, so, um, but I don't like to be too sound too old fogish. I grew up with print. So I value print. But art and literature will survive no matter how it's delivered to, to, to people. I've sometimes said uh, you know, that you know, people probably complained when uh, the Codex book came along. And you know, they, they said, you know, what was wrong with scrolls? Scrolls were great. You know? <laughs> what do we need the books like this for? We did OK. Um, so you have to be wary of being you know, too resistant to change. That said, what troubles me about the, the rise of computer literacy is the way it's, the way it's used by kids. Um, kids use computers to search for answers to questions. And they go real fast. You ever see kids, you know, they just go from screen to screen, boom, 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 boom. And they're looking for the answer in their mind. They're not reading around an author's work. They're getting no sense of the context often of what they're 
searching, you know, for, and more importantly, or not they don't you you don't really gain what grandiosely you would call the kind of wisdom that books can deliver unless you give them a sustained, focused, active attention. You have to interact with them. You have to, to you know think about them. You have to mark up the page if they're not a library book, and you know and you 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 make them your own that way. The computer is 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 a, is in the business of delivering facts and information as fast as possible. It's a slightly different system. That may change. We now have this Kindle. I've looked at it. I, the pages are pretty readable. They they go dark and they irritate me because they're black for a second when before they you know turn the page. Um, but I, I also like books to be different. I don't like all my books to look exactly the same. I like some to be big, some to be fat, some to be small, uh, some to have you know illustrations. They, you know, um, I used to, I remember writing objecting to the Library of America when Raymond Chandler was was um, included. Not that Chandler doesn't belong in the Library of America because he is an, an important writer, a wonderful writer, but somehow it seemed wrong to read him on this Bible paper in the same way you're reading, you know, Henry James's The Golden Bowl. You're supposed to read Raymond Chandler in 35 cent paperbacks with leggy blondes on the cover and <laughs> gumshoes and trench coats. You know, I mean, that's, that's, that's where they, that's what it should, should look like. You know, it's somehow wrong this other way. Um, I, so I like the variety that you get when you have a library of books as opposed to a uh, kind of just a collection of text available uh, electronically. Question there? Do you have any recommendations or favorites of literature from Spain? I noticed that uh, wasn't a huge selection of Spanish literature in your, your um, list. I, I, don't think they, I don't think there are any in this book. There, I, have a, I have several in the uh, earlier books I've done. I've written about a lot of the Latin American writers and about um, some of the Spanish uh, writers as well. Um, I'm trying to think who, who I would suggest. Oh, um, on the tip of my tongue. Well, I, I do have, I do have, I do have figures, but uh, they, you know, exactly which ones are in which books escape me now. Um, and I will, I will, I will add though that I do have a kind of prejudice against Spanish literature. I have a long essay on Don Quixote. I've read Don Quixote two or three, two, two, two times all the way through and dipped in. And I don't like it as much as I think I ought to. I don't think it's very funny, for one thing. I think Don Quixote is incredibly cruel. And I don't think the jokes work. I think it is a wonderful resource for lots of the, the narrative techniques. It and Tristram Shandy will teach you everything you ever could possibly one need to know about postmodernism. Um, but um, there's a lot of Spanish literature that um, just doesn't interest in me between Don Quixote and oh Miguel de Unamuno. I mean, there's not a whole lot for me. I'm I'm a francophile by by inclination, with some you know, and somewhat of an anglophile, and then lots of world literature. But uh, you know, my motto is you know is the old one is happy as God in France. Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, do you read books in other languages? French. Um, I can I can I can do I can read German haltingly, I can read Latin with a trot, um, and I'm trying to learn Italian, but um, unless uh, it's so hard unless you're unless I were in Europe, but it's hard to to, to to carry on with these things. Um, but I lived in France where I taught in the lycée in France, and there was a time I knew French very well. I could uh, had even had a Marseille accent. I could I could pass for French for maybe 90 seconds with French people. <laughs> I think it was quite an achievement myself. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. Is there any difference in your mind between listening to books on tape and reading them? You seem to encourage the proactive reading as opposed to listening. I like, I love uh, books on tape. My memoir is in fact going to be a book on tape. Record, uh, recorded books is doing it. Um, the problem with books on tape well, they have, first of all, they're wonderful advantages and benefits. I, you know, you get a good narrator, and they just, they are enchanting. It, it is like being a kid again, listening to your mother read fairy tales when you're in bed. They're, they just are mesmerizing. I, you know, I have a particular, I have lots of favorites. Uh, Naxos, uh, which is the uh, cheap classical music line, also has some audio book line. 
the guy who does uh, Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the, of the Roman Empire is just wonderful. And the guy who does Proust is wonderful. One is Philip Jason, one is Neville Maduk, and they're, they're just terrific. Jeremy Irons reading Lolita. Ah, oh, to die for. Really, just wonderful. I mean, no, you can't believe these, you know, that he does, he does all the voices so well. Um, so I love those things. Well, the problem, uh, uh, you know, sometimes books are a bridge, so you might lose something there. Um, sometimes you'll get a bad reader. But the only real difficulty, I say, is that uh, you can't, can't really make a note or people don't tend to go back. It's harder to have a kind of argument with the text if in the way of an active reading. You more or less, you enjoy the story, you enjoy the performance of the narrator. And that's, that's enough for most of, the, most of us for most of the time. But um, sometimes you need to kind of hunker down with a pencil and compare things and notes and flip back and forth. And uh, audiobooks don't lend themselves to that. Other questions? Way in the back. What kind of distinction do you make, if any, between the books you read for work and the books you read because Michael wants to read? Well, what, what distinction do I need the books I read for work and the books I read for, for pleasure? Well, as I, I say when I'm, I've been asked that question before, uh, I don't read for pleasure. Um, I get pleasure from what I read, but the one problem, the one drawback of becoming a professional book reviewer or literary journalist is that everything becomes grist for the mill, basically, and you're, you've got, and it's always time to, to make the donuts. I have to write a book review every week for the Post. Sometimes I have to do background reading for it. And I'm usually writing for other places as well. I write for the New York Review of Books from time to time, and uh, the Chronicle, the American Scholar. So I've got, always got something I have to read. And my only hope is that I will have chosen wisely enough that I will be reading books that I would want to read anyway and that do give me pleasure. That said, it, it, uh, it even wrecks you for the few times when you have vacation and you, you sit on the beach, you know. I mean, I sit on the beach and I read, you know, um, the ABC Murders by, uh, by Agatha Christie, and I'll start using a pencil and marking things here. Let me go back, check this. I think she's saying some. <laughs> it's terrible. Uh, you, you, you lose the, the, the ability to read for pleasure. And in fact, as I've gotten older, I, I, I now be, have begun to daydream, as we all, all do when we, we um, reach a certain age, about, well, if I, you know, I just stopped doing this kind of work, I have this huge pile of books I would like to just read for pleasure, or books I would like to go back and reread again. And um, someday, I, you know, if I'm lucky, I'll get a chance. Of course, I won't. I mean, I'll never. I probably won't. You know. And if I just say, uh, finally free at last, you know, uh, I finally bought the farm. It's like the FBI. You know, you always get killed just before that. You get to enjoy <laughs> it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, how about one or two more questions, then we'll stop. Okay, Any, if there are one or two more questions, is there some? Yes, yes. Uh, you don't find that criticizing the book is the actual pleasure? I, I like finding the themes in them. Do, do I find that criticizing the book is the actual pleasure? Um, well, <laughs> I understand what you mean. And yes, I can see, uh, I would say there is a pleasure in it. I do, people, some, you know, people often complain about writing, that they don't like to write. I, I actually like to write. Sometimes there's an initial barrier to settle down to do it. But once I start, I lose myself. And I, you know, complete tunnel vision, hours go by. I like to write most of my pieces start to finish within one period of time, however long it takes. And sometimes it takes quite a, quite a while for me because I'm, you know, as I say, I'm not particularly gifted, but I am dogged. Um, and I will, you know, I'll work hard on the sentences and I have an idea of what I want them to sound like. For me, the most important part of writing is, is, is the establishment of the right sound, the right tone, the, a certain pitch, uh, quality of the voice. And that will vary somewhat from piece to piece. So I get pleasure from that. And there is a kind of aesthetic pleasure. Um, more often than not, too, there's also the, the, the flip side where I will you know, hit my head and you know, say, like, um, well, I could quote exactly how it is, because I actually quote this uh, in this book. Um, one moment. Some of you may know that Edward Gorey's little albums, his first one was about a writer. The, it was called The Unstrung Harp, 
came out in 1953, a portrait of a writer working on a novel with the same name, The Un Unstrung Harp. And here are just two quotes from it. Um, Mr. Earbrass, it's all in the present tense, has been rashly skimming through the early chapters of his new novel, which he has not looked at for months, and now sees uh, the unstrung harp for what it is. Dreadful, dreadful, dreadful. <laughs> he must be mad to go on during the ex unexquisite agony of writing when all, it all turns out drivel. Mad, why didn't he become a spy? How does one become one? He will burn the manuscript. You, you feel that way, you know, I, I, my phrase is, uh, I, I usually say, whatever gave me the idea that I ever could write? <laughs> but, as, um, and here's another, I'll give you another ear breast quote later on. This is also the literary life. He goes to a, a book party in, in London, an author's party. The talk deals with disappointing sales, inadequate publicity, worse than inadequate royalties, idiotic or criminal reviews, others declining talent, and the unspeakable horror of the literary life. Um, <laughs> One more question. Uh, where was it? Uh, yes, OK. Um, I was wondering how contemporary you felt you could choose for your book. Um, I was thinking of somebody like the Japanese author Mariko Yoshida, who wrote a book called Mariko Yoshida. I decided early on that I would have no living authors. It would, it would, it would lead to too many problems. I have some writers I deeply admire, and I've written about them. And some, there are, some of them are in Bound to Please. Um, I think Blood Meridian by Cormac McCarthy is a wonderful, amazing, if terribly gruesome book. Uh, I love the writing of Stephen Milhauser, uh, Russell Hoban, uh, a good many writers. And I thought, well, if I started picking one or the others, they would all, you know, say, why wasn't I in your book? But the, <laughs> The dead, you know, the dead, they travel fast, as uh, Dracula tells us, but they don't usually uh, come back to haunt us, at least when we don't leave them, we don't include them in our books. I think this and gentleman had maybe the last question. The last sir. question, yeah. yes, okay. okay uh, is there any particular type of book that you'd like to review best? If I'm given my druthers, what I like to review are I, what I think of our neglected classics, do rediscoveries, books from the past, that, um, that I think are wonderful and that people should be more aware of. That's my preference. Love, if, it, if it has to be a sort of a contemporary book, I probably like biographies best because they give me a chance to write about an author's work as a whole rather than uh, focus on a single book. Although sometimes you can build a single book into a consideration of a of an oeuvre. Well, again, thank you all for coming. And um, I, uh, I hope you'll, you'll pick up a copy of this book or any of my other books. If not today, sometime. Birthdays are coming. You know, <laughs> Christmas. Holidays of various sorts all require gifts. And what better gifts? <laughs> this has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.